pause for a second while we just um, uh, stop and start the recording again. Okay. For our next, uh, our next speaker uh, is Amy, Dav Amy Davis, who's from Ghent University in Belgium. And uh, Amy is going to talk to us about using the Global Biodiversity Information Facility Occurrence Data for Automated Invasive Alien Species Risk Mapping. So thank you very much, Amy, um, and welcome to the floor, I guess. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, hello, I'm Amy Davis. I'm a postdoc at Ghent University here in Belgium. And today I will talk to you about our workflow that we developed in R as part of the TRIOS Invasive Alien Species or TRIOS project using GBIF occurrence data for automated invasive alien species risk mapping and modeling. Our goal was to create a workflow accessible to non-modeling experts. And the mission of TRIOS, just to give you an overview, is to develop open reproducible workflows to mobilize data and evidence for risk assessment in the hopes of informing invasive species policy and monitoring and forecasting which geographical areas are at risk or at most or at most of risk of, of invasion is an integral part of the risk assessment process. Risk assessment in the context of invasive alien species involves examining all available data following a structured pro protocol such as the Harmonia Plus shown here to gauge the threat of ecological, agricultural, or economic impacts of potentially invasive alien species to support evidence-based policy. And risk models, again, risk models and maps are a key component of uh, the TRIOS risk assessment process. Species distribution models or SDMs are our main tool for forecasting risk. And SDMs correlate species occurrences with spatial predictors to produce maps of habitat suitability for the modeled species. Um, it has been consistently demonstrated that algorithm choice is a, a major source of uncertainty in, in model forecasts. Different algorithms and the associated parameter choices can lead to different predictive outputs, sometimes vastly different. Thus, there is this need for reproducibility. And there are a lot of decisions and technical details that can overwhelm new adopters of SDMs. So we have tried to uh, we've tried to automate these decisions using best practices to results in the most robust maps or and models possible. So now I want to tell you about the top seven best practices that the TRIOS modeling flow performs automatically. First, it generates invasive alien species risk maps under scenarios of future climate change using an ensemble of machine learning algorithms, combining the predictive outputs from multiple algorithms, <clears throat> multiple algorithms into a single ensemble model reduces variability and uncertainty and often can result in higher accuracy. So you can see the results of the risk maps here for historical climate in each uh, RCP future scenario. And each one of these maps, each one of these risk maps are accompanied by a map of confidence. And so these confidence maps are generated using conformal prediction, which is a statistical method that can assign confidence of predicted values with a guaranteed error rate, uh, basically based on the data the model has already seen. So this provides intuitive visualizations of how confidence of the model varies across space. Next, GBIF data, like all ad hoc data sets, are spatially or geographically biased because the reported occurrences 
tend to follow where the people and the infrastructure are. So we account for this um, geographic sampling bias using taxonomic occurrence grids in our modeling so that we have a more reliable prediction of risk across space. And basically the taxonomic occurrence grid summarizes the sampling effort of the higher, the higher taxon for the modeled species in a one degree by one degree latitude by longitude grid as shown here. The fourth thing that our workflow automatically does in the spirit of best practices is use a hierarchical model structure where we first characterize the niche of the alien invader at the global scale and then fine tune this with, sorry, <clears throat> with climate and habitat data specific for Europe. And the climate data was provided to us by the Royal Meteorological Institute's RMI of Belgium and has the advantage of being based on regional climate models as opposed to global climate models, thus providing more reliable forecasts of climate change for Europe. And finally, the risk maps for, for Belgium are extracted out of the risk model for Europe. The fifth task that our workflow automates is it detects and removes highly correlated predictors. And uh, highly correlated predictors can have undesirable effects and confuse the interpretation of, of variable importance. And here I'm just showing you, uh, giving you a glimpse of what the code looks like in our, our markdown. And it, it will report to you which predictors were <clears throat> identified as being highly correlated. Next, our modeling flow also integrates multiple machine learning algorithms in an ensemble modeling framework to predict risk. And as I mentioned earlier, again, it's been consistently demonstrated that the choice of algor algorithm has a large impact on predicted risk. And so you don't need to do anything, it's automatically parameterized for you. And finally, as a post-processing quality control step, our modeling framework assesses spatial autocorrelation in the residuals to assess the impacts of clustering. And if, if it's uh, found that the spatial autocorrelation is high, thinning can be employed. Um, and so far, uh, I've, I've modeled a lot of species and I actually haven't found um, very substantial spatial autocorrelation using this framework. So how can you create automated invasive alien species risk maps for your country or region in Europe? Uh, first, you need to download the R scripts on GitHub along with the necessary spatial predictors which uh, are or soon will be available on Zenodo. This workflow needs the outputs of two other scripts uh, that are also on GitHub as part of the TRIAS modeling project, um, including the occurrence cube script, which aggregates species occurrences, the species occurrence data to a one kilometer spatial grid. Basically the main thing you need to supply as the species or list of species that you want to model and the GBIF taxon keys in a text file. Once these are all in place, you can run the workflow. So two, two minutes, Amy. Okay, thank you. In summary, we have uh, tried to develop a fully automated and user-friendly workflow that Fosters uptake into um, fosters uptake by invasive species managers and decision makers, and again, our goal was transparency and reproducibility to obtain better and more reliable science and invasive alien species policy making. And some of the tangible outputs of this of this workflow is that it provides in, invasive alien species risk maps at a one kilometer spatial resolution using GBIF occurrence data for any European country 
as well as uh, a visualization of confidence, or you could think of the inverse of that uncertainty in model predictions. Uh, finally, uh, I, I thank you all for your attention and you can see uh, our scripts and, and the modeling that the scripts for the that are marked down for the risk modeling on GitHub. And I also, I didn't do it justice, but I encourage you to attend my colleague Damiano Aldoni's talk later today, who will present, um, who will tell you more about how to aggregate heterogeneous spatial species occurrence data. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much. That's great. Thank you very much, Amy. Uh, we, are, we have a couple of questions coming in uh, already. So the first question is from, for, from Katrina Exter, who asks, how easy would it be to expand the model to incorporate other data such as bio, beyond biological, um, phys phys physical and chemical properties as well? Uh, are these properties that you can map? Are they spatial? <laughs> that would be my question back. So yes. <laughs> then certainly, yeah, it would be it would be fairly simple. You could just include it into the workflow. You as in you the person downloading it and modifying the code or you as in working well, together. If you know with something you, about you R, yes, <laughs> it would be it would be relatively straightforward. I, I if you if you're not an R. I'm, I'm not sure how easy it would be. Um, that brings would that up be a something, good something to do together with you, Ghent, with you guys, or like as an independent? Um, so, 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 so you could uh, download the scripts, and you're free to do whatever you want with it. But of course, I and I would be happy to collaborate with you to 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 work on that as well. So that's that's definitely a possibility. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. So the next question is from Quentin Groom, who asks, can you give us some idea of how long it takes to run for one of the models? Oh, that's a great question as well. Um, right now, from start to finish, it takes about 45 minutes. And that includes if you uh, are um, mapping all of Europe, you can you could sort of skip, if you're producing the risk map for Europe, which you, you, could, you could skip that step. So if you skip that step and just uh, model a smallish country, it's probably down to a half an hour. Uh, we have the next question is from Mary Kennedy, who asks, how complicated would it be to revise the scripts for use outside Europe? Um, not very complicated in the sense of uh, you would just have to think about um, what data you're replacing it with. So, for example, you know, there's already global climate data layers out there, such as Chelsea and Bioclim that a lot of us are already familiar with. Um, it just depends on, on what your approach would be if, if for example, um, your region has also maybe specialized more uh, has a, if your region has climate data more detailed climate data um, I, I think it would be pretty straightforward Andrea Hahn asks what is your experience with data availability through GBIF any taxa or groups where you would point out data deficiency um, <laughs> that's a terrible question to ask somebody that really only knows about plants. <laughs> I mean, my specialty is plants and, um, and my friends and colleagues are all into birds. So here we have like the two, some of the most highly reported uh, species in, in, in uh, GBIF. Um, so I, I really, I'll, I'll tell you, I, I, I you know, the, the, the imbalances are there um, and there's different ways to address them. And I, um, I, I really can't speak to uh, um, more detail than that. Um, I have a question, um, sure. which is, um, uh, so um, people interested in biosecurity are often interested in not just the risk of invasion, but the risk of establishment. Um, do the models talk at all about risk of establishment or predict risk of establishment? 
So that's that's a really good question that kind of gets at some of the nuances of what we mean when we're doing species distribution modeling. Um, so, uh, so def certainly in my data, I didn't with these downloads. I'm not distinguishing if if the species have already if the occurrences have been reported as established because I think at the end of the day we would hardly have any data at all because that attribute isn't very um, widely used. Um, so I, I would say that, uh, yes, we just have, it's, it's, it just shows you the risk of, it, it is the risk of At the end of the day, that's um, or is it you know actually there like the, the difference between the potential risk of invasion and the actual level of invasion? Um, yeah, I just think the models. Sorry, I know I'm rambling a little bit. At the end of the day, the models do indeed show you the potential risk of establishment. Um, that's terrific. Thank you. I think that's um, the end of your grilling. Um, with the questions <laughs> at the moment. Um, if anyone has any further questions for Amy, please feel free to put them in the document and we can come back to them later. So thank you very much.